Um, hi. So Chris and David, they emailed me a few weeks ago and they were like, hey, we're planning on doing an OLEO at The Strand where we're going to talk about people having sex with robots. Would you maybe want to give a short talk about that? And I was like, yes. I'm like, yes, I absolutely <laughs> would love to talk about that. But full disclosure, I've never actually had sex with a robot. So I'm not sure if you still want to do that. And he was like, I've seen Westworld on HBO, um, and they were like, no, that's cool, we already have a specialist, a very awesome Sky, who's gonna come talk all about that. We were just hoping you could help with the historical angle. And so here I am, just as fascinated by this topic as all of you are. Um, has anyone here ever had sex with a robot? There was some dude, <laughs> there was some dude there that was like, ah, and then like, kind of like put it down. Um, I'm an historian by training. I read about the history of privacy, which means whether I like it or not, I had to be a historian of technology. Uh, at the moment, the history of technology, it is kind of really blowing up as a field um, in universities nationwide. Um, what a lot of people probably don't know is that the field isn't so much about tracing the history of a certain piece of technology, it's about studying the relationship between people and technology. Um, how we respond to new innovations, how technology changes the way we interact, the way we work, the way we express ourselves and all that kind of stuff. So before Sky comes up and starts talking about the philosophical considerations of people fucking robots, we should take a second to become more familiar with, I think, some of the basic tools that are used by people who study technology for a living. Um, now, the best way to do that in like the five minutes I have to give this talk would be to introduce you to a series of really famous old school intellectual principles. They're called Kranzberg's Six Laws of Technology. And we never hear about this, and we never hear about Kranzberg or the Six Laws. Okay, so Dr. Melvin Kranzberg. Um, He's a professor of American history at Georgia Tech. He was a founding member for the Society of the History of Technology. He edited a leading academic journal in the field. It's called Technology and Culture. He also won the Da Vinci Medal, which if you haven't heard of that, is a really, really big deal for scholars of technology. Now, at the end of his career, before he died, he gave this really famous speech about the six most important things he learned throughout his entire life studying the history of technology. And in the field, we call these the six laws. The six laws aren't really straight up like commandments. They're more like a set of maxims or like truisms, but they're super useful to anybody who wants to start thinking about technology from a bit of a more elevated perspective, or if you just want to start speaking about these things a little bit more intelligently. So let's do it. Um, the first law, technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. So what the hell is he saying? Um, what Kranzberg's saying is that technology when you look at it, it always interacts with societies in ways that go beyond the original purpose for which it was designed. To put it another way, he's saying that technology, it ripples out in super unpredictable ways that are often positive and negative and neutral all at the same time. So it's wrong to say that any piece of tech is just one of these things. It's a good tech, it's bad tech, it's a neutral tech. Um, anyone here know what DDT is? Remember that from when you were a kid? Um, no, right? You don't remember that from when you were a kid. Um, yeah, it's a pesticide. It's a synthetic pesticide. It was developed in the 1940s. What's the problem? Yeah, it's straight up like super toxic. Um, it doesn't have a good reputation now, but for the first couple of decades, DDT, you have to understand, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, is considered a godsend by most of humanity. Food production soars, regions in the world that couldn't feed themselves can suddenly feed themselves, and everybody's really grateful to science for inventing such a wonderful product. It turns out DDT's toxic, and it wasn't just harmful to humans, it's also harmful to ecosystems, like birds and fish especially. So in the early 70s, Western nations banned the use of DDT. So this seems kind of like it's flying in the face of the law, right? Isn't DDT bad? Like we can say squarely, right? DDT bad. Um, but that's not necessarily true. The thing is, after people found out it was toxic, there was one nation in the world that kept using it because they found a positive use for it that outweighed the negatives. Again, they knew that it was toxic, but they still decided to embrace it. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Anyone here from India? Okay. Uh, well, I was going to talk about India before. In India, DDT. Um, it's used less for agriculture than it is for disease prevention. And so from the 70s forward, it's very good at killing the bugs that transform, especially malaria. Now, before DDT, and just really wrap your head around these numbers, before DDT in India, there are about 100 million cases of malaria a year. 
By the 60s, once DDT is in full swing, it's down to 15,000 cases a year. Again, from 100 million to 15,000. Death toll drops from 750,000 people a year from malaria infectious disease to 1,500 just a year after DDT is being introduced. And so even after it's declared toxic, the Indian people still welcome DDT as a blessing from the scourge of disease. It's a lesser of two evils kind of thing. Now, so here's the thing that on the surface looks absolutely bad, but from a different perspective, it's a good thing. So what is it? Is it bad? Is it good? Well, it's both, right? And neither, kind of at the same time. The point is that the same technology can answer questions differently depending on the context of who's using it. We see in the kind, same kind of dialectic with nuclear power. Um, as an energy source, nuclear power plants, they have the potential to provide an almost unlimited supply of energy. And in the 50s, the idea of nuclear power, it fills Americans with this huge sense of hope um, and awe about the future that technology could provide and what renewable energy sources would look like. But you know, at the same time, this technological breakthrough also gives humanity almost the capacity for unfathomable destruction. Nuclear power is amazing, but especially now with increased tensions, I mean, this still may very well be the thing that kills all of us, right? Like, I mean, Rocket Man and crazy ass tweets about like buttons and things like that. Um, it is this kind of scourge that at the same time is an incredibly amazing positive that powers like our battleships, that powers more than 20% of the United States of America. Um, so hang on, good, bad, neutral. What about medicine? Things like antibiotics. I don't want any like anti-vaccine shit like in this thing. I'm just talking about like, um, what about advanced surgical tools? Isn't that like an unequivocal good? Wouldn't that kind of disprove Klasberg's first law? Can anybody make a case against modern medicine or surgical tools? Because there is one. Yeah. Right, so people are living mad long now, right? Like, we're not raising social security or anything like that, but like, whatever, that's a different talk, right? But like, we're talking about essentially, so people are living a lot longer and the population of planet Earth has increased considerably, especially since the introduction of broad spectrum antibiotics in the 1950s. And you know why antibiotics are super useful? It's not just because like, before the 50s, if you scratched yourself on a nail, you're like, fuck, I guess I'm dead, right? Like, it's not, it's, do you know the thing about broad spectrum antibiotics? Why this is like makes people live so much longer, life expectancy? It's because you can perform surgeries you never could before. When you open people up and they're being like, you know, just even basic little microbes in the air, when you're pumping people full of bacteria, now they can be open instead of one or two hours, like eight, nine, 10 hours long surgeries. Why is this bad? Superbugs, sure. Also the fact that like, there shouldn't be seven billion people on this planet. Planet Earth can't handle seven billion people, especially not like ballers, right? Like when we're out like with our technology and things like that. Look, let's be real, right? Like 70% of you have to go, right? Like, I mean, when it's all, you know, if we're really talking about it, all kidding aside, right? Haha, -ha, we're all gonna die. But like, there's a thing where, do you understand population growth? As much as we talk about renewable energy fuels, source and things like that, the population expansion, that is really one of the biggest problems. Um, and there are ways that we need to counteract this with science. So even something like modern medicine holds up to the first law. It seems great, but there is also a negative reflect, like reflection. And when you're looking at it honestly and objectively and dispassionately, you can't forget that. Um, it's important, again, not to make absolute value judgments, and that's what Kranzberg's saying. The same piece of technology can be twisted to serve positive and negative aims at the same time. It's immeasurably more complicated than, oh, that's good, or that's bad, or that's neutral. You with me? First law? All right, second law. Invention is the mother of necessity. Uh, this is him being cute. This is a play on a popular expression. What's the expression? Yeah, necessity is the mother of invention. You guys have heard that before? Makes sense, even if you hadn't. We need something, your back's to a wall, and humanity tends to shine in these kind of ways. We especially see this in wartime, right? Like when you, just these advances in war, in war technology, in weaponry, and also other types of things that help win wars really seem to expand when we have the proper motivation. The idea that Kranzberg's saying is actually, when you look at the history of tech, it works the opposite way. He flips it around, he's saying that when you look at the history of tech, it isn't so much a need that's followed by a solution, that what really happens is there are these huge genius level breakthroughs, but then what happens is you need a bunch of additional little breakthroughs after that, that get motivated in order to bring that technology to market and actually help people. To put it another way, super new technological breakthroughs, they don't work unless there are these immediate flurry of activity that comes afterwards to actually tweak and tailor and make it something that we could be useful. Um, the breakthrough causes the flurry of invention, not the need. 
Radio is a really good example like this. It's not like someone was just hanging out in a lab in a basement one day and then like, boom, I invented radio. Hold that, you're welcome, humanity, right? Like first you have this guy, James Maxwell. Anyone here of Maxwell? He's a mathematician, he's Nobel laureate. Um, he basically proves with math that electromagnetic waves exist and can travel through space. That's 1864, huge contribution. Really, may we all be able to accomplish something half as important um, in all of our lives. More than 20 years later, this guy Heinrich Hertz, he's able to conclusively prove through experimentation that electromagnetic waves can be transmitted. That's such a straight deal that we, sh that's such a big deal that you know we straight up name those waves after him. You've heard of like megahertz? That's Hertz, like that's the guy. Um, then in 1893, Nikola Tesla, he starts fucking around with high frequency electrical waves and comes up with a way to transmit a signal from one machine to another machine without using wires, which is pretty nifty and worked out really well for everybody. And then the following year, Guillermo Marconi puts a lot of existing theories together, adds some tweaks, and then introduces the first wireless radio. It isn't until 18, 1918 that Edwin Armstrong comes along, this guy that everyone forgets, and invents something called superheterodyne, which is why we can actually adjust frequencies. He also invents FM kind of accidentally in the process. So you see what I mean about invention being the mother of necessity? We never get the finished product first. We have these genius level breakthroughs, but then when you really study the history, it's little minor tweaks, a flurry of activity that comes afterwards. That's the nature of technology. Um, look at cars, this is a good example. When we finally start seeing the widespread uses of cars in the 20, they're far from perfect. You need all these other advances to get them where they are by the 50s and beyond. So like in the 20s, people start getting flat tires all the time because they're a new thing. So what do you think that's gonna lead to advances in? Yeah, rubber, right? And so you have the car, but then because the tires aren't quite holding up the way they should, you see this breakthrough in chemical engineering in terms of rubber, what rubber can do, how it's gonna be more resilient. Um, what do cars eat? They eat gas, right? Which means that, and it's just suck the oil out of the ground, throw it in your car and you're good. No, you need branch throughs in chemical engineering in terms of petroleum for fuel, taking lead out, having different grades for different engines, different agencies. Um, you're rolling up your window, Glass, right? Like advances in glass technology so that it breaks in different ways when you have accidents. Also glass that can handle high speed, bug slapping in the windshield and things like that. This also brings new techniques like things in road construction because people are tired of buying a car and then blowing out an axle every time they drive down like a country road. So you start seeing better road crew. Again, necessity is totally the mother of invention but realize too that invention is in the history of tech, the mother of necessity. Technology usually has this big breakthrough and then it prompts this whole series of little breakthroughs and that's what gets us the finished product. Hang on, I just need it. Mm. I don't get to drink at work. Um, the same concept is a big part of Kranzberg's third law which says that technology comes in packages, big and small. This is really just him kind of expanding on the second law. What he's saying here is that most great inventions, especially after 1920, should never be perceived as just one single item. That what technology really is, is a package. It's a bunch of small things kind of put together. The best example of this by far is gonna be your smartphone. Um, think about your phone. Is it just one piece of technology? Or is it like 15 different things kind of all together in a nice sleek little package? Um, just break it down, what's in your phone? I need there to be a back and forth, otherwise I get horrified that no one's listening to me and you're just like, yeah. Um, okay, so you have a flashlight, right? Like revolves in, that's, yeah, I bet you use the flashlight more than you do like the actual telephone, right? Right? Okay, uh, so, all right, I'll get you, touch screen technology advances in that, right? Which is in, in and of itself an amazing thing. Um, what else do you need? Batteries that need to go through, some type of Wi-Fi connection that can establish these things. Um, Chipsets, Gorilla Glass, right? Like different kind of coding and things like that. Um, these things are packages. So this principle rings true with a bunch of tech, basically all tech. It works true with the internal combustion engine, with radar, with television, with electrical systems, with the instant camera. Technology works through systems. And that's what Kranzberg means by packages. In the tech field, we call this mutual dependence theory. It's basically when one component changes, the other parts of the system then have to undergo all these transformations so that the system can continue to function. It's a great mistake of the mind, really. It's a deficiency in thinking if you look at tech and just see it as one thing. Um, really, to start understanding what's at play, realize that there's a system at play, a multiplicity of things constantly interacting with each other. Um, this very much applies to modern sex dolls. Um, 
advances in rubber, right? Advances in lubricant, advances in shapes and sizes and authenticity, but we're gonna let Sky enlighten us about all of that. Um, Kranzberg's fourth law, this one's a mouthful, although it's now, whatever, you can read. Um, <laughs> so we probably should have reworked the title on this, if we're being honest, that shit's mad clunky, but we're talking about politics here. Um, essentially, what men and women in power talk about the impact of technology, and they do all the time. Um, they really just look at the technological solutions to problems, that there's always a human element. Again, politicians, leaders, they talk about tech all the time, but almost never really look for just technological solutions to problems. There's always a human element. I know that comes off as a little complicated. Let me explain it through like the story of electricity. So, when modern cities like ours in the 19th century start deciding they're going to switch from gaslight to electricity, we're gonna have a grid, we're gonna have wires hanging everywhere, people have to put these things up. Um, different cities take different approaches. On the surface, you would think, on a tech sense, the goal is the same for everyone. Every city would have the same goal, which is, I want an efficient, safe, and cost-effective power grid that can stand the test of time and may easily fixed if we have bad weather. Like the one that we have here in New York City, which is run super efficiently by Con Ed. We have the second largest grid in the world. Um, we don't really experience blackouts or brownouts at all, even in August when every single one of us are like humming. Really, Con Ed does an amazing job with this. Anyone know what the biggest grid in the world is? The most wattage that gets put out by a major city? It's not in China. Close. Not in India either? Yeah, Tokyo. Um, and especially Tokyo too doesn't really suffer from blackouts or brownouts. It's incredible what that city is able to do. And I've never been to other parts of the world where they can't keep the lights on 24 hours a day, right? A lot of that isn't because of technological deficiencies, it's because of politics. It's because of people and the way people interact with each other. And so these political basic things, like keeping the lights on, which, all right, like, maybe you can make the best of it and get, like, cozy with a special someone, right? But if you're in a hospital, no one's gonna have a sense of humor about that shit. Like, these are things that are really important and things that, like, you know, absolutely can be a matter of life and death. Um, now, when Chicago is trying to electrify in the 19th century, they lean on this brilliant engineer, this guy Samuel Insull, and he gets the city up and running, and for the most part, very quickly quickly, very efficiently. London and Berlin, anyone ever been to London or Berlin? London and Berlin, they try to electrify and the local governments get super concerned about preserving their own authority. Where's the power grid gonna, gonna be? How is this gonna impact our patronage politics? And with local influence starts screwing with everything, everything falls to political infighting. And the end result is that London and Berlin for most of the beginning of the 20th century had these really poorly designed electrical grids that really lag behind most cities in the modern world. And it is, from a technological standpoint, kind of an embarrassment. My point is that when technology meets politics, technological advances often suffer from a kind of like political bullshit that has nothing to do with technology. Nowhere is this more apparent today than with climate change. Um, as a civilization, we understand that we need to make significant changes in our technological choices, and science seems more than ready to pick up the slack with exciting new green technology if you can kind of get the state to move past it. Um, but because a lot of people will lose their jobs in that transition, and because it's political expedient to kind of position climate change as some elite conspiracy cooked up by academics like me who know nothing about the real world, and many of our leaders just kind of flat out refuse to embrace the necessary technological change that that we need. Do you understand? It's not really a scientific problem as much as it is like, it is a scientific problem, but very much also a political problem. So, <laughs> sorry homie. Um, if decisions about that were the best for technology, were just about technology, these things wouldn't happen. And so this political reality, when you're talking about this, can't be ignored. Not just political realities, but also um, social and philosophical ones, which I think is what Sky's gonna be spending a lot of time talking about. Um, just to show you, do. Politicians involve themselves in terms of morality? Yeah, morality laws are a thing. Um, they usually happen on the state level, but absolutely. The fifth law, all history is relevant. The history of technology is most relevant. I like this, this is a pretty baller statement coming from like the historian of technology, right? Like, oh, by the way, like fifth law, my history is the best history. <laughs> my, you know. Um, this is not my personal opinion. Um, I can't deny that Kranzberg makes some good points on this, though. The big question facing all historians, as a historian, you mentioned this on the first day, where does power lie, right? 
why do things happen? It's not just a study of change over time, what happened, but why? Why are these things happening? Obviously, there are a number of different answers to where power lies. Um, Kranzberg says that true power in the world, when all is said and done, generally lays with the civilizations that embrace technology and technological innovation. The ancient Greeks, they're known for their logic and their democracy and their intellectual contributions, but let's be real, none of that probably would have mattered as much if they weren't so good at building boats and being able to kind of go around the world, establishing these networks, not just with trade, but also an information market, right, where they're able to bring things back and forth, spread these ideas throughout the world. You guys know why the cotton gin was so important? I mean, yeah, for slave owners, it's great, but like in American history, this is the kind of thing that they sometimes bring up in middle school when they're trying to explain why technology isn't just technology. Hmm? Sure, well, you can get cheap clothes, definitely. Um, the cotton gin is invented in the 19th century. It's implemented in the Deep South. So we have two different kinds of cotton. We have long staple cotton, and then you have short staple cotton. Um, the thing about cotton is you can only kind of, I mean, I don't think anyone here has ever picked cotton. I haven't, but you know, there's seeds. That's the problem, is like, that's a pain in the ass, so it limits your amount of things. Um, the cotton gin basically allows for a just breakthrough in terms of an explosion of what you can do with the amount of cotton that you pick. American historians are usually very quick to point out that because of this technological advances, the Deep South is able to extend and extend and expand, and the slave empires in the 19th century expand and expand and expand because of this, and in a lot of ways that expansion is one of the chief factors behind the Civil War. And so there is this kind of direct connection between this technological invention, a bunch of political flurries, and then suddenly, you know, you have the Civil War. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying like the Civil War, Eli Whitney, that's why it happened. But I am saying that you can't ignore this fact, that you probably wouldn't have seen slavery expand the way it did without this innovation in the big staple cash crop that slavery in America is kind of centered around. So in a lot of ways you can say the, Eli, the cotton gin does help cause the Civil War. Speaking of wars, it's our industrial output that helps us win World War II. Um, look, American soldiers are very, very tough. G.I. Joe definitely dug in in World War II and did everything he could on both fronts. But we didn't win those wars because our soldiers were just so much better. If you don't believe me, ask someone who actually fought the Nazis or the Japanese if they were tough, and I'm sure they'll let you know how tough that they were. Do you know that our industrial output, America, in World War II, was more than twice that of all of our enemies combined? Again, just ours, not us and our allies. Our industrial output was more than twice that of our enemies combined. You know what that means? We're like a juggernaut. Anyone read comics or know what juggernaut is? He's like a ninja, right? He's mad quiet, he assassinates people. No, right? What's juggernaut's thing? Somebody, please. Yeah, he is unstoppable force, right? He keeps coming at you. And the United States, because of our technological supremacy, because of our industrial supremacy, is a juggernaut on the battlefield. If you blow up one of our tanks, one of our battleships, it's like, like, no problem. We have five more in the water or on the battlefield the next day. Japan, that's a string of islands, right? And they're slapping us around for the first two years in that war. But the thing with Japan is half the reason they start the war is because they get cut off to their raw materials. Their industrial war machine isn't like ours. And so when they lose a battleship, that hurts. That's not something that you can just kind of, like, go back to. So, again, the history of technology does kind of maybe decide who wins World War I and World War II. Technology just doesn't win wars. It impacts our patterns of work, it impacts our social interaction, it changes our standards of privacy. Um, politics, society, culture, race, class, gender, it allows foreign powers to influence our elections. Now, we should be careful here. If we go too far, we do risk getting trapped in something called technological determinism. Anyone wanna take a guess at what that might be? This is my biggest problem with Kranzberg's fifth law. Because I give talks at the Strand, so I totally got to say like, fuck Kranzberg. Um, Right, absolutely. And philosophically, historically, any social scientist and, or you know, uh, humanist should be very wary of any type of determinism. If you're saying that the chief power lies behind one kind of aspect, it means that you're then going to look at history and just kind of fit your narrative into this idea that you already have. There are a number of things that impact the world that have nothing to do with technology. Um, decisions made by people, culture, human expression, these things are very important. And if we focus too much on technological developments, it can blind us to very real things where power does lie. But nevertheless, this is one of the probably most hotly debated of Kranzberg's laws. We're not going to debate it right now, um, but it's an interesting thing to talk about, and it's something that should definitely be on your radar. If you're into history, if you consider yourself a history buff or a student of history, really ask yourself, is the history of technology the true driving force behind change over time? At a base level, is it the most important thing? It might be. All right, one more, and then 
fucking robots. Um, Kranz earns six, Kranz earns six laws. Technology is a very human activity, and so is the history of technology. To put this succinctly, technology and humanity, the machine, the human being, they're always gonna be entwined. Um, whenever you look at a piece of technology, the human ramifications should never be far from your mind. There's an old story, um, this great violinist, Fritz Kriesler, uh, he was giving a concert, and after the concert, this fangirl comes up to him and she's like, Maestro, your violin makes such beautiful music. And Kriesler just looks at her and kind of takes his violin and then he holds it up to his ear, and he's like, I don't hear any music coming out of the violin. Um, do you get what he's saying, though? Historians of technology don't just study tech. They study the relationship between technology and humanity, because that's where things get really interesting. Um, the only people in this world that should be looking at technology for technology's sake are maybe engineers, but even then, maybe not, because it's the job of an engineer to also understand a technology's application, potential application to real human beings. This is why what Sky is about to talk about is so important. What makes what she has to say interesting and relevant is how the technology of sex impacts us, what sex means for people. This law, this is perhaps the most important of the sixth law. To study technology is to study people. That's how the music gets made. Everyone with me? Thanks, thanks for coming, this was fun. Um, <laughs> If you found this at all interesting, I'm doing a four-part OEO series downtown in Tribeca starting April 5th. Um, we're gonna talk about tech and warfare, entertainment, privacy, and explore why we don't make things in America anymore and why that maybe isn't a bad thing. Um, the info's all up on the website. Thanks again. That's all right. Um, I wish I could have a beer before every class, but uh, no, that's fine. Um, okay, let me figure out. Okay. So, I'm going to ask you three questions during this presentation. Um, and it's not going to be about whether you've had sex with robots. Uh, and to set the record straight, I have not actually had sex with a robot. Um, <laughs> Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about, I've got a quick trivia question. This is going to be the first question, so if you know the answer, just shout it out. And those people who were here earlier, who saw me flip through the slides, you know, you're excluded from this. <laughs> All right, when was the first dildo created? Pretty close, 28,000 years ago. <laughs> that was the ice age. <laughs> okay, so, it's made from highly polished stone. It's about, I brought my ruler. Uh, it's about, it's 20 centimeters long, and that is about 10 inches. And it's about three and a half centimeters wide, which is about as wide as this ruler, slightly wider. So they think it actually was a dildo and wasn't just used for um, kind of religious purposes because it's so lifelike. <laughs> um, so now skipping just a little bit ahead, 150 years ago, a doctor came up with the first steam-powered vibrator. Okay, that kind of freaks me out, but um, okay, and it was by a doctor. It was used to treat hysteria in women. Um, <laughs> uh, and basically this is my face, like my inner dialogue when I look at that vibrator. Um, so, okay, I wanna skip to the 21st century, okay. The Lilo Aura, it kind of looks like a fancy perfume bottle to me. It is actually a vibrator. And what's interesting to me about this is that these tools for women to use are looking less and less like male body parts. But the tools for men's pleasure are looking more and more like real women. And that's what I really want to talk about here. So. Has anyone read Ovid's Metamorphoses, written in about 8 AD? Okay, I'm going to go back a little bit. You've heard the story of Pygmalion, or heard, uh, or seen the movie, you know, My Fair Lady. So, Pygmalion was this guy, he was a sculptor, and I guess he kind of got sick of dating, uh, the dating cycle, and uh, so he retreated into his studio, and he started carving women, and he carved a statue of Galatea. This is Galatea here. And she was so perfect that he became completely obsessed with her. He started to 
bring her jewels and flowers. He started to talk to her. He was in love with her and would pray to the gods that they would turn her into a real woman. Aphrodite, you know, the goddess of love. So she heard his prayers and she's like, that's so sweet. How could I refuse this guy? So yeah, she turns Galatea into a real woman and they live happily ever, ever after. So this idea of sex dolls or the perfect woman is dates back really far. Okay, skipping up to the 17th century. You know, Dutch sailors, they used to go off exploring uh, the oceans and they used to get kind of lonely because there were no women on the ship. So they used to take dolls like this. Um, and they were made out of clothes or fabric. They even had um, uh, sort of uh, valves inside with like uh, liquid. I know, too much information. But the, <laughs> the thing is, so okay, so they um, took these along to make them... Um, help them be less lonely. And if you've, has anyone ever heard of the expression a Dutch wife? Like, no? Okay, I think, I guess it's like in, in Japan and some places, like the Dutch wife is the term used for a sex doll still. Okay, so skip to 2010. True Companion is a company who released the first sex bot. Okay, so her name was Roxy. Um, she's always turned on and ready to talk or play. So this is where artificial intelligence starts being merged with sex dolls. And what's interesting about this is that it's not just about play, it's about talking. It's about companionship. It's about actually interacting with people. So interestingly, um, has anyone seen Lars and the Real Girl? A couple of people? Okay, super sweet movie. Okay. <laughs> Actually, is it? Yeah. Um, so this uh, picture is from when the main character um, introduces his new girlfriend to his uh, brother and sister-in-law. And he talks about how she used to be a missionary. Um, and <laughs> it's... Uh, so it's, it's actually really sweet. He is not having sex with her. It's actually he's um, in a romantic relationship with this girl. Um, so it, this one is not made by True Companion. It's made by Abyss, a company called Real Doll. Um, and this is their standard range, or, or, um, a recent range. I took this off their Instagram account. Um, so yes, obviously, they're all women. Um, and... Uh, okay, they also actually do make male dolls, but they don't really sell very well. Uh, they're looking into that apparently. It's like less than 5% of uh, the sales they make are of male dolls, and I don't, I don't think many women are actually buying those. So, <laughs> okay, so a bit, so real doll, I don't know if you can see the writing here, but they're asking, who would you choose? And people are like chiming in, oh yeah, I want one and three. They even know their names. Yeah, I want Tanya. I want um, Harmony. Okay. But look at this one. I don't know if you can see. JDub74 <laughs> says, I'd smash them all. I'd smash them all? Okay. This is where I start to have philosophical issues with what's going on here. Okay, so imagine you're vibrator. You're like, I want to smash my vibrator. I don't think I'd have a problem with that comment on Instagram. But smashing something that's meant to represent a woman, okay, this is starting to be a problem. So when we're talking about sex bots specifically, different to vibrators, three things. First of all, they're in a humanoid form. Second of all, they have human-like movement. And thirdly, they're intelligent beings. Artificial intelligence, certainly, but intelligent nonetheless. So this is where I started thinking about, well, the different, what is the difference between a vibrator and a sex doll? Okay, some people say there is no difference. But I was reading Jean-Paul Sartre's no Being in Nothingness, you know, as you do, and he actually talks about robots, or he mentions it in passing. And he talks about 
the difference. He talks about he has two categories of being, two main categories of being that he splits splits um, being up into. First of all is being in itself and second being for itself. So a being in itself, it's like that chair you're sitting on. It's just a thing. Whereas a being for itself is a human. So does anyone speak German here? What does ist mean? Is. It's the verb to be. So the chair you're sitting on just is. It doesn't have projects. It doesn't have intentions. It can't make choices for itself. It needs a being for itself to change it, to do something to it. So human beings, being for themselves, are exist. You know, ex means beyond or above. So that's what humans are. Humans exist, whereas things just are. So the difference is that human, as opposed to a vibrator or a sex doll, is conscious. Um, we have possibilities, agency, autonomy. We learn and we grow. We modify our situations through our choices. But a being in itself, like a sex bot, can only do what a for itself, what a human programs it to do. But the problem is, sex bots do learn. Sex bots act as if they have choice, as if they have autonomy. So, a quick show of hands. Who's seen the film, Spike Jones's film, Her? Okay. Great. So, just for those of you who haven't seen it, it's about an opera, a guy, Theodore, who falls in love with his operating system, played by Samantha. Uh, play, sorry, her name's Samantha, played by Scarlett Johansson. So, I think this isn't actually so absurd. You know, people fall in love with things all the time. Have you heard someone's actually married, a few people have actually married the Eiffel Tower? Like, super weird. I don't think it's, you know, uh, recognized in court or anything, but people do fall in love with inanimate objects. So it's not such a stretch to think about people falling in love with computer systems. So my second question for you my, is, could you love a robot in the same way as you love a person? What do you need for it to be equivalent? So just take a minute, talk to the person next to you, and uh, then I want to hear what you guys think. <laughs> All right. What do you think? Can you love a robot in the same way as you love a person? Who wants to? O over here? OK. Uh, yes? Is that what we're, You're like, yeah. Right. Um, well. I think it, 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 it's the mix between um, AI and then the physical uh, component that we were talking about. So if it was something like, um, more like, um, I can't remember the name of the movie, but the one with Alicia Vikander. If it like had like, I think it would be more difficult if it was ex like s ex simply an AI like her, but if there was like more of a physical component as well, it'd be different. So physical component makes it different. Okay, and we will mention X nothing. To expand on that, um, I feel like the element of shared experience is also like a big part of forming the feelings of love. And like this is mo this movie was a great example because they had this sort of growth together, and she learned about him, and he learned about her, and I think that's how like the love formed. Great. So shared history and emotions. Yeah, and that's going to be. Um, we're going to talk about some of those examples coming up, so thanks for that. Um, so, could you love a robot in the same way as a person? I'm just going to give a couple of perspectives from uh, different philosophers. So, there's Immanuel Kant. I know he's kind of a party pooper, but he says that love that springs from sexual love or love that springs from the sexual impulse is not really love. It's just appetite. So, for Kant, Human love is goodwill, it's affection, it's promoting the happiness of others and finding joy in their happiness. And I think you guys mentioned a good one as well, like a, a shared history, um, which he doesn't talk so much about. Um, so he thinks that sexual love is a degradation of human nature. And 
the reason he thinks about this is he sees a person as an absolute unity. So if you're just focusing on your sexual desires, then it's kind of detaching that part of your life from the rest of that person's life. So for example, he was definitely not into prostitution. He's like, because you can't like cordon off your sexual organs like that and contract them out. Um, so, and he was also against um, masturbation. Um, he thought that was um, unnatural. And again, it's disrespecting yourself. Um, and so he was all for monogamous marriage because he thought that was the best way that you can respect a person as a whole. So, I wonder though, that in the case of Lars and the real girl, those of you who've seen it, he's not having sex with her. He actually seems to love the whole person. I mean, he kind of, no, I won't give away a spoiler alert, but <laughs> he truly seems to care about her actual being, not just having sex with her. So, that's Kant on one end of the spectrum, an example on one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, you know, a philosopher who was a bit more of a hedonist, a bit more into enjoyment, was one called Max Stirner. Has anyone heard of Max Stirner before? I know we have a couple of, uh, yep, okay. Uh, <laughs> so Max Stirner was like, look, for, he was uh, a nihilistic anarchist and he um, was definitely against Kant and Hegel and all those guys. Um, and he says, look, really, we're all just objects for one another, aren't we? It's like, if you go out with your friends, okay, say you go out for a drink after this, are you going with your friends because you feel an obligation to them? Or are you going because you think it'll be a fun and enjoyable experience? He's like, no, of course you're going. If you go out of duty, then you're kind of an idiot. I mean, he doesn't say that specifically, but his idea is that, you know what? And I think he didn't talk specifically about robots back, he was writing in the um, like 1800s. But I think if he did, he would say, you know what? Whatever gets your rocks off, you do that, okay? <laughs> Whatever enjoyment you can squeeze out of life, go for it. Um, so, uh, so he's uh, sort of one example, completely the other direction. So in Spike Jones's Her, um, so Samantha is mimicking a lot of the features for him to fall in love with her, except for the fact that she's, you know, that doesn't have a physical form, which is dealt with in the film. But what kills it, specifically? Does anyone remember from the film? What is it that when he starts to fall potentially out of love with her? There, yeah, there's someone else. There are millions of someone else's. <laughs> She, he realizes that he's not unique. He's not being recognized for himself as an individual. She's doing this with you know, literally millions of other people. And that's what kills it for him. So has anyone seen the Black Mirror episode, Never Let You Go? Okay, you know that one. So this is Martha. She loses her husband, Ash, in a car accident. And she discovers technology where she can not only talk to him, but recreate him in robot form and have sex with him and um, a lot of other things. So um, <laughs> the problem is, though, what she finds, you know, she says, you're just a few ripples of you. There's no history to you. You're just a performance of stuff that he performed without thinking. And it's not enough. It's lacking those emotions. Um, so... It's lacking true reciprocity. So there's something uniquely human about the authentic recognition that we get from other human beings that's gonna be really hard for robots to recreate. So Jean-Paul Sartre, he built off Hegel's idea that self-consciousness exists only in being acknowledged. Like Jean-Paul Sartre says, you know what, if you're alone, you, know, you can do some deep introspection but there's gonna be a gap in what you know about yourself because there's a certain level of understanding about your being that you can only get from knowing what other people think of you. That's that gaze of the other. One of the reasons he says hell is other people because what we want is to understand what the other person thinks of us, to become 
complete. I mean, he thought it was never actually achievable, but we wanted to try. And so the big question here is, well, if you can possess your lover, then what kind of gaze are you getting back from the other? What kind of recognition, what kind of reciprocity are you getting through the gaze of a sex bot? Now, Jean-Paul Sartre said that, you know, if you possess a robot that loves you, that's programmed to love you, it's kind of a cheap and easy form of love. Um, he says, you know, we can't possess another person. There's, we, we're gonna, we want to possess another person in love, but there's always a gap. There's always some kind of nothingness. There's always a longing for the other person. And that, he says, is where love exists. And so he says later in another book, be, um, Notebooks for an Ethics, that to overcome that tension, to actually possess another person, might be to kill love. He's like, if you turn, if you actually fall in love with a robot and possess them, then it's not going to be the best kind of love that you can have. So, there is, however, so first of all, mutual recognition and reciprocity are the main blocks to robo-love, I think. However, there is a philosopher, David Chalmers. Has anyone heard of David Chalmers? He's the, he talks a lot about virtual reality. And he actually believes that one day we will be able to upload our consciousness to a cloud. Um, now, is anyone, no, we talked about Ex Machina for a minute before, but hands up if you've seen Ex Machina. Okay, good, most people. Um, so, Ex Machina is about this programmer, Caleb, who is the um, human component of a Turing test with Ava. Ava is created by this billionaire, Nathan. So, who knows what the Turing test is? So like, what, what's the Turing test? Just right. So, fool you into thinking it's not a computer. Like, and either, you know, being um, equivalent in intelligence to a human being. And the thing about ex machina is that Nathan, he knows she's a robot, but, oh, sorry, uh, Caleb knows she's a robot, but he starts to think that she should be treated as if she were a human because she's so convincing. She's designed to flirt. She's designed to fall in love. She's designed to enjoy sex. So, and Caleb kind of buys into it. And this plays very much, this film plays very much on what the late Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk talk about, that Artificial intelligence may evolve to be independent. I don't know. I need to know what Lawrence thinks about that. But <laughs> so, um, St and Elon Musk says that AI is going to be our biggest existential threat because they may evolve to the point where they can be autonomous, where they can make their own decisions. It's like when Jean-Paul Sartre talked about the being in itself and the being for itself. They're the concern is that these bots are going to become so much like a being for itself, so much like humans, that we're not going to be able to tell the difference. So, which brings us to some moral questions. Okay, so this is the third question I'm going to ask you guys. So, should we, should anyone, be allowed to do whatever they want with a robot, specifically a sex robot. Now think about the robots that are out there now. There is a sex robot called Frigid Farah. She will resist advances. She will pretend like she doesn't want sex, but she's a rape doll. Think about child sex bots. Is it okay? It, because it's a robot. Is that okay? Is it okay to abuse a sex bot? Think about Nathan, who cr the creator of those bots in Ex Machina. When he needs to create a new model, he just hacks up the old one. Is that a problem? Okay, take a minute. Talk to the person next to you about it. Okay, let's talk about this. I have some volunteers over here. Should, should we be allowed to do whatever we want? with a sex bot. Okay, sorry, what's your name? 
Thea. Thea, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Uh, uh, so our consensus was no, if the sex bot is sentient, like that's where we draw the line. If it's just a doll or just a thing without any thought, then yes. Okay, great. So sentience has a big um, uh, line we draw in the sand. Great. Okay, what else? Sorry, did you want to comment? No, no, that's, that's okay. Anyone, anyone disagree? Okay, great. Okay, you can agree. That's okay. We were discussing whether, because of you know issues with rape and pedophilia, a lot of these people seemingly can't be cured. It's part of their psyche. It's part of who they are. And if we gave them an outlet that didn't harm humans, if it was some sort of harm reduction, but not, you know, similar to how we treat heroin addicts with methadone, but instead of them harming themselves, they're harming other people. Does that, uh, it's not an easy answer, but does this create some avenue for harm reduction to others? Right, harm reduction to humans. That's a good point too. Okay. What else? Anyone else want to comment? Okay. Um, just as a counterpoint to that argument we were discussing, but does that actually get to the problem within those people? If you give them an outlet, you don't actually address the problems within those people. You're just giving them an outlet, which could trickle back into those people. Yeah, you're not actually solving the problem. Okay, great. Yep. So I just, just to follow up on that comment, heroin has to be introduced. So I'm just curious if maybe the same argument could be made for, for anything else. So sex bots are coming. Um, yeah, okay, so <laughs> they are. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, one more. So um, the human brain has a hard time distinguishing sort of fiction from fact a lot of the time. So even if something is a doll and we acknowledge it on the surface as being a doll, like our subconscious can still process that as being real. So if we inflict harm on something that is a doll and society considers that to be acceptable, there is no saying that those people won't go ahead and, and inflict that same harm on a real person because drawing that line in the sand is actually incredibly hard. And it's not necessarily a line that's a consciousness or uh, you know, an inanimate object without consciousness. It's the physical representation of a human being that like you look at that like this is a person, fake person, real person, this is a person. And then so you look at another real flesh and blood human being and those, those become equivalent people to you. And this is one of the problems I had, thanks for bringing that up, with that Instagram post with that guy saying he wanted to smash them all. It's a representation of a woman. So thank you. You guys are basically, okay, finish. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> it's like, no, you guys have brought up some really great um, points. So there are three questions that, or three ways I want to break this down. And that is, you know, the, this element of harm. Who does it harm? Who does it benefit? Okay, I'm not adding out things like a utilitarian, but what I just want to acknowledge is that we should be considering about the harms and benefits. And the first thing is does, okay, does it harm the robot? Does it harm the user? And does it harm society? So does it harm the robot? Well, you know, you go and smash up your TV and, you know, we're not going to have really a mor too much of a moral problem with that, maybe anger management issues, but um, otherwise it's just, um, you know, we're not entering into territory because it doesn't represent an actual human. However, if we're smashing it up because it doesn't turn on and entertain us like, like a sex doll, that's um, sta starting to get um, problematic. Um, but yeah, and we, um, uh, Thea brought up sentience. And that's a big one. If we think about, you know, the moral status that animals hold, you know, people have different views as to whether, uh, as to which animals are sentient beings and which aren't. And as, you know, thinking about back to Jean-Paul Sartre's framework, as those being in themselves become so much more like being for themselves that you can't literally tell the difference, if they start to feel things, if they start to feel pain, if we think they start to feel pain, then that will be a problem. Okay, so, and uh, this is Ex Machina's dilemma, as I mentioned, between Caleb and Nathan. They represent those two arguments against how we treat robots. Okay, so the second question is, does it harm the users? So, like we saw in Spike Jones's Her, you know, he kind of withdraws from society a little bit. He's withdrawing from other human interactions. That could be a problem. However, she does fill a gap in companionship, in support, and that's what we see in Lars and the Real Girl as well. Maybe 
these sex bots could even add variety and spice to relationships. Imagine if you decided you want a menage a trois, you don't have to get a real person, maybe you just get a sex bot instead. Like really, maybe that's a possibility. What if sex bots weren't just about you know, getting off, what if they were actually used to teach us about consent, teach us about how to please one another? What if they could be educational tools? Okay, so the third question is, does it harm society? Okay, so loneliness is a really big health issue, right? England has like the, a whole loneliness um, government institution set up. Um, so maybe these kind of companionate dolls that can fulfill our desires on multiple levels will help with that problem. You know, in the US, about 25% uh, of people are living alone now. I mean, obviously not in New York City, where we all have roommates and live together. But the thing is, like, so this is a general thing in the Western world. People are becoming more isolated. Maybe these robots could help fill that gap. But one of the biggest problems which you've probably heard in the media on a social level are the kind of feminist issues. I mean, the problem is, I mean, look at these sex bots. Where are we? I mean, they look like porn stars, don't they? Like, what is this telling us about representations of women? That women are possessions? That women should be subservient? It doesn't mean that people are gonna go and treat them exactly like they treat a sex doll in real life, but the question is there. Um, and there's your question up the back um, about maybe it's better to rape a robot than to rape a human. Now, I personally think we should be giving men more credit than that. Um, but, uh, you know, there is the question that um, was also raised in the audience. Maybe if we uh, say it's okay to rape sex bots at home, then maybe that's normalizing behavior. Maybe it would encourage rapists. I mean, these are empirical questions that we don't know the answer to. And the other question is one that I think Lawrence, I want to talk to Lawrence about, is the issue of privacy. Did anyone hear about that lawsuit um, recently where the vibrator company was collecting data on, on how often and on what frequency, like on what power level people were using their vibrators? <laughs> like talk about an invasion of privacy. Also tied to what, sorry? Individuals can be identified, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so if, if vibrators can collect this sort of information, imagine what kind of information sex bots can collect on us. Right, so let's think about the future. As I said, the sex bots are coming. And by some estimates, the market is going to be worth about $30 billion. There have been some surveys out there that say about 40% of men say they're pretty interested in sex bots. Um, so, I mean, the question is, at what point do we recognize them as equivalent to human beings? We talked about sentience, but there are still questions about animals in that respect. Um, so, how do we think about this going forward? So, one philosopher who I quite like for thinking about this is, um, okay, let's get through this. Okay, it's Soren Kierkegaard. Now, just stay with me for a minute. Now, he was religious, I know, but he was also a big inspiration to most of the atheist, all of the atheist existentialists because they just sort of didn't worry about the religious part. So for Soren Kierkegaard, the aesthetic lifestyle, there are three stages in life. The aesthetic is the kind of foundational stage of life. It's about sexual desire. It's about passion. It's about falling in love. It's about beauty in life. It's about indulgence. But the problem is, he says, if that's all your life is, if that's if you're just going around being a hedonist all the time, then you're probably going to end up, you know, in not in very meaningful relationships and going through cycles. You know, I don't know, is anyone on Tinder or any of those things? It's like, you know, like, <laughs> like these dating apps going over and over again. And so what he says is like, that, gets, that will get boring and repetitive after a while. So what you need to do is make a leap into the ethical and think about 
meaningful relationships with other people. Think about duties to society. Thinking about how you actually interact with other people that isn't just on a pleasure-seeking level. And ultimately, he leapt to the religious sphere, which he just, I mean, really, he just thought, you know, Christianity promises happiness, like for eternity. How could you not want that? But uh, um, so the point is, he kind of thought in the religious sphere was all about loving thy neighbor, you know, loving everyone. So it was a more, so you can see how it was easy for the other existentialists just to forget about that bit. But um, so this is kind of how I see sex bots, you know. It, whether you're religious or not. Like we should be, like let's embrace it. Like they're coming, they're here, they're interesting, they can open up a lot of possibilities for us in our relationships and pleasure. They can maybe even make our current relationships better. But we need to also think about that within an ethical realm. Think about how we treat these sex spots thinking about them, like even though I kind of reject Kant in general, like thinking about them as a whole robot <laughs> and thinking about if they get to the stage where they're sentient beings, let's think about what kind of life they're leading. So, this is what I think. Thank you. How great was that? Right? Sky will answer any questions you guys have. Were there any questions? Is this on? Yeah, yeah right? Yeah. Um, just on a basic level, the necessity of technology. For Sky? Uh, could you imagine me having a sex phone? It's probably sex phone. It's probably sex phone. Thanks. This is a good question. In fact, I was talking to my friend Ellie down the front here about this recently. And she's like, what? Where are you going to put it? <laughs> like, <laughs> like so are you going to like keep it in a cupboard or something? Um, I, don't, I mean, I don't know that that's specifically what I'm advocating, but how many, does anyone not have a toaster in their kitchen? Okay, a couple of people don't have a toaster. Does anyone not have a fridge? Like, okay, does anyone not have a television or a phone? Right, okay, so I feel like, <laughs> okay, so there are these technologies that we use that seem to be pretty ubiquitous because they serve a purpose that we need. I mean, who knows if, how much you need toast, but <laughs> the point is, I mean, I need it every morning, but um, <laughs> the point is, you know, this, um, if we can create them not to just be act like porn stars and prostitutes, if we can create them to actually open up possibilities for everybody, for relationships, then I, maybe we will get to the stage where they're kind of a common occurrence. Now, in households, however, right now, I mean, they're really expensive. So that real doll, like the basic model is like $5,000. They go up to like $50,000, depending on how, you know, what kind of manicure you want on them and things like that. Um, so I don't know. I don't know that it'll happen in my lifetime. But I think we're erring to go, heading towards, you know, that kind of direction. Yeah, I think what she made a point earlier where she said, in a lot of ways, as social scientists and humanists were kind of exploring these questions, which are questions we should totally explore. But there is an empirical side that we, that we simply don't have because we're on the cusp of this, right? Like we haven't quite, we're not, we haven't div like dove head first and now we're kind of swimming in it for a couple of decades. And so this might be where social psychology really picks up. Um, and I can see an entire exploding field, especially as we approach what, you're familiar with the term the singularity? Um, which is this theoretical concept where there'll be this idea where essentially we'll hit a tipping point and AI will actually become sentient un unequivocally. Um, and that you then have to have this, all these considerations of, well then do they have rights and like what is our interplay between these things? Um, because you can't just say, oh, well, that's sentient so therefore it shouldn't be degraded. I mean, animals are sentient and we domesticate them and slaughter them and you know, kill them and put them in really embarrassing costumes, right? Like, so they don't have the same rights that we have. Um, so what I would say is I really think that social psychologists would then kind of immediately jump on this and start running very interesting samples and, and you know, experiments about the impact these things have. And I think that 
mixed with the questions that people like us ask will then kind of derive new solutions. I think that very progressive families who believe that sex is something that should be discussed very openly, and by which I mean, I'm not talking about like, oh, we're kind of progressive, I try to eat veggie twice a week. I mean like, you know, there are some families that are like, you know, hyper open, almost like a communal kind of like sense in terms of sexualities. They would probably be the trailblazers and then, you know, to see how it plays out from there. Yeah. Uh, I've I've not I've. Right. We're very we're in our own heads. We're thinking about sex or sex concepts in our own time. Like you know, we're always thinking we're the most progressive. We're the most. We're probably the most whatever. But sex has been around a long time. It's been around a long time. So maybe that historical aspect could be really interesting too. Sure. Um, I've not read a history of sex bots, um, but like there is a thing where no, I know what you're saying. I don't. I don't. I'm not going to sit here and bullshit. Like, I don't have a, uh, I, there is really no data in that. I mean, I would say a great place to start looking in an American context as an American historian would be the sexual revolution and, like, at, at its peak, at its most expressive in terms of free love and that, like, people in the late 60s and early 70s actually believed that perhaps they were building, um, you know, this kind of laying the foundation for something where by the time we were at 2018, marriage would be this kind of, rejected as a bourgeois concept and so would monogamy and that quite didn't work out. Um, I'm a big believer in dialectics despite being a capitalist. Like, I mean, I think that in the end to study history is to study a relationship between two simultaneous, uh, mutually exclusive like kind of ideas, right? So as people would become more liberal with sex bots, I think immediately you would see a very fundamentalist, conservative, strong push as well that would exist. And then what would happen is an interplay and a conflict between those things. And to study the interplay and the conflict between those things, I think, would be to really study the present moment. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question for both. I know you mentioned earlier. What? Don't, don't give them a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I don't think it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I know you mentioned that there was patterns, right, specifically for women, uh, sex, sexual toys were deviating more from the male anatomy, whereas for men it was leaning more towards actual female representation. Uh, so in regards to that, I'm wondering what your thoughts are as far as where you see, to what end do you see uh, sex bots evolving? Are we looking at as close to humans as possible, or are we looking at something that just appeals to everyone in whatever way that might be? Okay, so I think I, I'm, uh, if you, anyone read my bio, I'm uh, kind of of the existential leaning, which rec emphasizes that we're all individuals. And uh, so in terms of that, I mean, that's, this is one of the reasons why I'm so keen for us to use sex spots as tool to teach, tools to teach people how to pleasure one another, <laughs> okay? Because the sex spots that they're creating now, like for women, no one wants those. Like, I mean, the thing is that, um, you know, the sex bots, like, they, they have penises, they don't have vibrators built in. Like, why not? Like, these are the things that women are enjoying, but the tools that we're creating are built by men, or these sex bots are built by men for men. And as we get women involved in the creative process, which is part of the whole feminism thing, like designing things that women actually want, like the Lilo Aura, Things like that. I think that'll open up a lot more opportunities. Yeah, I'm in agreement. Um, I mean, I don't have much to add. <laughs> I also lean uh, toward the existential in terms of my like worldview. Um, yeah, I think that as a teaching tool, it, it could be excellent. Um, I wish I knew more about why, because I find myself thinking more about how can we answer these questions instead of having an answer for them. But yeah, I would love to know why is it, because there's a market element here too, right? Which is in and of itself its own kind of litmus test, right? Where why is it that literally probably tens of millions of dollars go into the production of these male sex bots with, like I remember seeing something on HBO about that. They had like different size like penises that you can put into them and like there was a number of modification tactics as well super expensive and like you said they just crap out whereas it seems to be exploding in terms of the female dolls for the male targeted audience so I, I would love if someone could start I don't know why but I think that 
it's not just a product of advertising. I think that's what the demand seems to want, that maybe there's a certain amount of discretion, maybe that has to do with social stigmas, whereas you know a man just keeps the doll in the closet, right, and like does what he does, and then it's fine, because he's that old school, fucked up mentality of like, well, a man just needs a receptacle or release, right? Like, whereas a, a woman's more in tune intellectually with her sexuality, which isn't true, but like nevertheless is something that, you know, is a prevailing stereotype. But I find, I find the sales figures to be interesting. And like, I would like to look more into that because I think what's worked and what's not, having been, like you said, at least probably 10 years into this being a legit investment opportunity that people pour money to and then bring it to market and advertise and, and have hundreds of employees that try to move this out. And we are getting data and information back from that, you know, and it seems that women aren't interested in that, whereas men very much are. And yeah, I'd love to know the answers as to why. I guess I just want to say one thing about men being a receptacle. Like, really? I don't... Them needing a receptacle. Yeah, I don't know. I want to, no, I know, I'm not accusing you personally. But I guess I would want to challenge that. I'm like, really? Because these sex bots are evolving, like, to be not just about sex. They're be evolving to be actually companions. That's why all this money and this technology is going into having them talk, having them being able to tell jokes. So I guess I, I would want to clarify that it, maybe it's not just about having a receptacle for sex, but a receptacle for some, something much more than that, like a companionship. Yeah, I was talking to the gentleman back there, whose privacy I'll respect, um, about <laughs> the, no, about how, but even with, because I feel that if we're pre-sentience, which a lot of us talked about, right, that like our ethical line was, all right, if there's no sentient, we're cool, if we're past sentient, then there's a whole new series of ethical considerations that probably we can't work out in a couple of minutes, right? And so pre-sentient, the vibe I get, and I, this is pure speculation by all means, we're just riffing, right? But the, the vibe I get is that there's a real dominant aspect to it, and to a female sex bot that, like you said, the market has demanded that they take very, very, very realistic female forms, or at least imaginated, imaginated like imagined female ideals and stuff like that. But to truly dominate would require s being able to trick yourself into thinking that that person was a real person who was then surrendering. Do you know what I mean? Like in terms about you know being dominant and being submissive, it's not just there's this item that you can be dominant. It's still a person that you've either forced to surrender control or is willing to surrender control based on your presence and, and what you're projecting and things like that. And so when I hear that they tell jokes and that there's companionship, and I don't know if this is correct, but what I think is, yeah, it makes it more lifelike and the dominance becomes that much more real, like where you're able to trick yourself into it. But again, this is just, that's the first thing that popped into my head. It doesn't mean that I am often wrong, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. From like a sales analytics standpoint, if you think about who the target audience is, it's probably the same target audience as like most pornographies. Um, up until probably really recently, like most um, most pornogra pornog pornographic materials are geared towards men. They are the primary consumer of it. And so like Lawrence was saying, when you think about the fact that these sex dolls, they can tell jokes, they can chat with you. You know, it rem reminds me of like, you know, that the, the running joke about the pizza delivery man, right? Who comes in and like delivers his pizza and like chats with the girl for a little bit. And then out of nowhere, they start having sex and it becomes this, almost this like way of playing out this like real life porno with these sex bots because like there is as shallow as it possibly can be there is conversation um in porn and but they are but the entire concept is geared towards men and so that's why i think that the female sex bots are selling more now um just for the same reasons yeah, thanks for that. And I'm, I guess we're not, you know, the, the data on, like, who's buying these sex bots and how many are being sold, it's, you know, we don't have a lot of information on that. And whether they are people who are, like, watching porn or um, whether they are just lonely people wanting a companion. But, yeah, it'll be interesting to, you know, try and understand that eventually. Yeah, I think you're right. I just, I wonder the extent to which... I see the future as a blend between the old and the new, and that traditional tropes of desire and sexuality will, will find their way in, particularly persistent ones, because when you study sexuality, there's just stuff that's been getting people off for thousands of years with like minor tweaks, but like a, a very much a sameness, right? And then there's so much that changes and so much that's different. And so I guess I, that's what I'd be interested in seeing. I know that the, 
you mentioned the changing dynamics of family, right? Like if you introduce a sex bot. I know that has a lot to do with sexual attraction. I mean, they just released the list of like the big pornography searches. It just came out like a couple of days ago um, for 2017. And w surprisingly what the top, like the, the number one and number three were stepmom and stepsister. Right? And like, no, but that's interesting because, and then there were a bunch of these like, almost like kind of high art, not high art, but like high journalistic arguments saying like, well, that's weird. Like, cause obviously this correlates with a very, very visual shifting dynamic in terms of the family, right? With like so many divorce being more commonplace and things like that. Um, so, I mean, introducing the sex spot to the family, I just, I do know that those things do like change. I, that's it, yes, thanks. Hey, um, so I kind of wonder with like VR advancing all the time, why would someone spend five grand on a robot that would be like really embarrassing if you like your mum comes around or whatever? Like if you can just put on a headset and you know, just like have computer game sex or whatever. Yeah, so why not virtual reality? Why a sex bot? Um, I don't know, I can only speculate, but you know, having something, I mean, maybe virtual reality will get to the stage where it does feel like, I mean, this is Westworld, right? Westworld, that's what it's called? West well, Westworld. Okay. Well, there's, I was just, in fact, I was reading up on Westworld recently and they were saying that maybe, maybe it is just all a video game. Maybe it is actually virtual reality. So there's that possibility too. I just, sorry, no, 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 it's someone's hypothesis. But uh, sorry, no, I haven't, I'm not giving anything away here. <laughs> Um, but I mean, I guess at the moment, I mean, these sex bots are being developed to, with heartbeats that increase the more you play with them. They're being developed with temperature controls inside, so they heat up. Sorry? Do they sweat? I d okay, I don't know if they sweat. I don't know, but they do. This is a good question. They do, they do have, um... You know, there are liquid, can I just say there are liquids involved? Like, but how, I don't know exactly. I haven't actually been involved with one. But, um, yeah, so I wonder if there's something in, like, the touch, like the actual concrete touch that might be uh, alluring to someone. And, yeah, I mean, there is, like um, Lawrence was saying, a social stigma involved in this. Are you going to hide it, like, I don't know, in a cupboard when your mum comes over? But then again, you know, there's been lots of taboo things throughout history that are pretty normal now. Um, so I think that social, like, uh, factor about sex bots, I think that's gonna uh, go away eventually, especially if they stop looking like like crazy porn stars. <laughs> but yeah, no. yeah I, I actually think that that might be a nice battle that would happen in an open market for these things. I think that different people would prefer different things. Um, and just because of my own research, my mind immediately, like you said, goes to privacy. And so, yeah, I think that a VR machine that you can do first person shooter games with and that like it's okay to have that in the house, like it's understandable and then it's like, oh, there's also this like sex mod that you can get that's not just a visual but maybe also like an extra apparatus, right, that like surrounds genitalia and provides pleasure in that regard. Like that might be, I'm sure there are people working on that right now. Um, and so I don't know if it would be either or, I imagine both of those things coexisting and I think both have taken more than just preliminary steps toward coming to market and like being this thing that's introduced. Um, VR, any of you guys ever been to like any VR like entertainment centers and stuff? They're around, I still haven't. I know that people who love it, love it. I know some people have a problem with the depth perception and that it messes with your head and people get nauseous, right? And so I know that both would be working out the kinks. When I think about the sex bot pre-sentience, I still, this is, and again, it's just speculation. I know as much about this as you do. I still always see it as someone kind of squinting their eyes, turning their head a little bit, and imagining that they're fucking something that's real, right? Whereas the virtual reality is kind of an immersion thing where it's multi-sensory, right? Like that's what it's supposed to be doing, at least as far as I understand the technology, um, with sight and sound and kind of like then a touch component if they could add to it. It's just, you know, I'm just spitting off stuff that I know about the field, but like, yeah, it seems there. Guys, thank you so much. You always do this and then feel like no one's going to show up. So really, thank you so much for coming.